With ordinary differential equations, there are really general theorems that tell you that the solution exists and is unique, at least locally in time. With partial differential equations, kind of all bets are off. The theory depends a lot on the specifics of the equations. I'm going to do an example in this video of a very common equation where there is a great theory of existence and uniqueness, namely the Poisson equation. So the Poisson equation is when you have the Laplacian acting on some field phi, and it's equal to some given source s. So this is given in space, some known function, and the goal is to find phi. So if you're studying this in electrostatics course, the source would be minus rho over epsilon naught, where rho is the charge density, but it comes up in many, many, many contexts. And you might want to know, when is the solution going to exist and be unique? Now, existence proofs are a little tricky, but uniqueness is much more manageable and very insightful into how you might manipulate partial differential equations. So I'm going to go over the uniqueness proof in the case of Dirichlet conditions. What that means is, if you have some region of space, R, and you're trying to find the solution to this equation inside the region of space. What you're supposed to do is give the value of phi on the boundary of the region you're considering. So phi on the boundary is just specified, some specified function. And you're given that as part of the problem, and your goal is to find phi. And we're going to prove that phi is unique. There can't be two different phi's that both have the same value on the boundary. Now, I want to emphasize that when you specify it on the boundary, you're not necessarily saying it's a constant of the boundary. For example, we could consider the case where the boundary is a circle. And we could label the angle on the circle as theta. And we could specify phi on the boundary to be some function of theta, like 2 cosine theta. It doesn't have to be constant on the boundary. And then we would solve for phi, and the claim is phi is unique. So solve for phi in the circle, and phi is unique. So we're going to prove that now. We're going to go in steps. Now whenever you do a uniqueness proof, almost always the way you start is you say, well, suppose it wasn't unique. Suppose there were two different phi's. So suppose both phi 1 and phi 2 satisfy the equation and the boundary condition. So explicitly, what does this mean? It means that the Laplacian of phi 1 is equal to s and the Laplacian of phi 2 is equal to s. And they also have to satisfy the boundary condition. So phi 1 on the boundary has to equal the specified function. And phi 2 on the boundary also has to equal the same function. OK? So now we think. Suppose they weren't unique. So, excuse me. Now we think, suppose they were both solutions. And the trick with proofs is you generally want to consider the difference between the two. Our goal is to show that phi 1 equals phi 2. If we can do that, then we've shown the solution is unique, right? Because we suppose they were different, but they weren't. They were actually the same. This proves that it's unique. And the trick is we do we equivalently introduce phi 3 as the difference between phi 2 and phi 1. And then we want to show that phi 3 equals 0, so that phi 1 equals phi 2. So this is the setup. And the setup is the same for almost any uniqueness proof. Consider two possibly different solutions, phi 1 and phi 2 but consider the difference phi 3 and show that the difference is 0, so that phi 1 actually equals phi 2, and indeed the solution is unique. So now that we've set up the problem, 
we can go through actually trying to do this. And here, there's no sort of recipe. Every equation is different, and I'm going to show you how it works out for the Laplace equation. Okay? So first, let's figure out what equation phi 3 satisfies. Well, notice the Laplacian of phi 3 is equal to the Laplacian of, well, phi 3 is defined as phi 2 minus phi 1. And then by the linear property of the derivative, we can change this into Laplacian of phi 2 minus Laplacian of phi 1. And what is Laplacian of phi 2? Well, that's equal to s, the source term. And what is Laplacian of phi 1? Well, that's also equal to s, the source term, as you see up here. Phi 1 and phi 2 are both equal to the source term. And so this is just s minus s, and it's 0. Okay, so phi 3 satisfies not the Poisson equation, but the Laplace equation has no source. It has 0 on the right-hand side. That's going to be very useful. But don't forget about the boundary conditions. We're specifying phi 3, phi 1, and phi 2 on the boundaries. So what is phi 3 on the boundary? Well, phi 3 on the boundary is equal to phi 2 minus phi 1 on the boundary. But that is equal to just phi 2 on the boundary. You see where this is going. Minus phi 1 on the boundary. And now similarly, what is phi 1 on the boundary? Well, it's some specified function, like, you know, 2 cosine theta in that circle example. And what's phi 2 on the boundary? Well, it's the same specified function. It would be 2 cosine theta in that example. So in fact, these are the same thing, and the difference is again 0. And so we see that phi 3 on the boundary is 0. So now we've at least set up the equations satisfied by phi 3. And now we need to figure out a way to show that phi 3 is actually 0. This is where it really depends on the basics of, on the specifics of the equations. And so for this step, which I guess is step 3, show phi 3 equals 0, we really have to use a trick. And the more general version of this trick is called an energy estimate, uh, sort of a physics terminology. But basically the idea is you look for something that's always positive, and you take its integral. And so here's the something. I can't really motivate it anymore. What you do is you consider the divergence of phi, I'll drop the threes for now, phi, now let's leave them on, phi 3 gradient phi 3. This is interesting because it's a total divergence, and so when we integrate it, we can use the divergence theorem, okay? That's, that's part of why you should think of this as useful. But let's see fully why, so now we use the Leibniz rule to expand it out. So the first term, we get just grad phi 3 dot grad phi 3 from when the gradient acts on the first term. And from the second term, we get phi 3 times the divergence of the gradient of phi 3. But of course, the divergence of the gradient is nothing but the Laplacian. And the first term, we're going to just write for simplicity as grad phi squared. And the second term is phi 3, is phi 3 Laplacian squared phi 3. But phi 3 has no Laplacian, right? So that means we can send this to 0. And so we have the nice equation that the divergence of this, this phi 3 grad phi 3 is just grad phi 3 squared. And that's useful because this is positive. This is a vector squared, positive or 0, but never negative. Okay, and that's going to be the key point. So what do we do? We integrate both sides of this equation. That one equals that one. So over the volume, over the whole region R, Remember, there's some region here with a boundary that we've shown 
up here. So whatever that region R is, we integrate over it. So integral over the region R of phi 3, uh, excuse me, of divergence of phi 3 grad phi 3 dv. That's the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, integral over r grad phi 3 squared dv. And now what? Remember the divergence theorem? We have the integral over a region of some total derivative. And so that becomes just the integral over the boundary. And this could be in two dimensions or three dimensions. I'm using notation relevant to three dimensions. Uh, but the proof in two dimensions is similar. And so this becomes the integral over the boundary of the thing we were taking the divergence of. Grad phi 3 dotted into the area element. When is that equal on the right-hand side? Well, there's not so much we can do to this for now, except to note that this thing, is, the integrand is always positive. And so this thing on the right-hand side is also always positive, or at least 0. So let's just write it again, grad phi 3 squared dv. OK, you still with me? We are almost there. There's just a little bit more to do. We have to think very carefully about this equation. So first, the left-hand side. It's the integral over the boundary. And what's happening on the boundary? Well, on the boundary, phi 3 is actually 0. OK, so what does that mean here? Well, oops. What does that mean here? Phi 3 is actually 0. And so this whole thing, because it's on the boundary, is actually 0. All right? Left-hand side is gone. So actually, the right-hand side is equal to 0. What does this mean? Well, when you find the integral of a something being equal to 0, it doesn't mean that the something is 0 in general. Right? Suppose we had a function like this. Suppose we were integrating this function here. It's got a hump there but it happens to have the other hump on the other side. This is a function whose integral is 0. Integral is 0, but function is not. All right, it's a simple example. So just because the integral of something is 0 doesn't mean we can conclude that the thing is 0 in general. But notice that this function goes negative somewhere, OK? If it didn't ever go negative, if it were a positive or zero function, then if its integral were zero, it would have to be zero, right? So I, you know, if I tried to do the same thing but with a positive function, it wouldn't be possible. So if my function had to be positive or zero, you know, it could come down to zero and go up. It could do whatever it wants. But if it has to be positive or zero, then the integral is never zero. Integral of uh, let's just say the integral of this function is not 0. Okay, So the key point is, if you have a function known to be greater than or equal to 0, and its integral is equal to 0, then the function itself must be 0. Okay, So this thing in here is greater than or equal to 0. So the fact that its integral is 0 actually implies that the gradient of phi 3 squared equals 0. OK, I spent a lot of time on that. And maybe some of you wouldn't have batted an eye if I had just continued and said, OK, we learned that grad phi 3 squared is 0. But this is a very important point. You, have to, you can only make this kind of argument when you know the thing inside the integral is greater than or equal to 0. That's why we went through all this trouble to do this particular integral and not some other integral of some other function. OK? And so now we're really on the home stretch. We've learned that grad squared phi 3 is 0. Grad phi 3 squared is 0. But of course, if a vector squared is 0, the vector itself must be 0. So grad phi 3 is equal to 0. It's not quite what we wanted to show. Remember, we wanted to show that phi 3 is equal to 0. We've only shown that its gradient is equal to 0, otherwise known as phi 3 
is constant. But remember, phi 3 has a value on the boundary. Phi 3 vanishes on the boundary. That was part of the whole setup. Okay, so if it's 0 on the boundary, but it's constant everywhere, what constant value does it have to take? It has to take the constant value of 0. So remember, but phi 3 on the boundary equals 0. So phi 3 equals 0 everywhere because it's a constant everywhere in R. And that, at long last, is the proof of the uniqueness theorem. So let's summarize where we came from. We started talking about the Poisson equation. And we asked the question, when will solutions be unique? And I told you one answer, which is the so-called Dirichlet problem where you solve it in some region of space with some boundary b, and you specify the value of the function on the boundary. In that case, the solution exists and is unique. I haven't done the existence proof in this video, but I did do the uniqueness proof. And the strategy was to consider the difference phi 3 minus phi 2 down here. And then with the difference, we tried to show that phi 3 equals 0. And we did this by figuring out that phi 3 satisfies certain equations. It satisfies the Laplace equation, and it satisfies the boundary condition that it's zero on the boundary. And then we did, made an interesting vector identity that helped us create this integral where one side of the integral, this one on the right, the integrand was positive, and the other side, by the divergence theorem and the boundary conditions, the integral was simply 0. And so we concluded that the integrand itself, the gradient squared of phi 3, had to be 0. And so gradient of phi 3 had to be 0, and phi 3 was constant. And in the end, it had to be 0 because it was 0 on the boundary. And that completes the proof.